I don't know about you, but have you ever asked that question, what would have happened if, uh, you know, what would have happened if I'd chosen Italian food instead of Thai food? What if I had studied something different after high school? You know what I'm talking about. I, I find that as, as you get older, I'm not that old, I'm only in my 40s now, but I find that as the years go by, you have more crossroads that you have come to. And of course, with a crossroad, with a decision that you need to make, you can only make one decision. But then as you've made that decision and you look back at the decision that you made, you kind of go, was, was that the right decision? What, what if I had chosen the other road? What if I had chosen something different? Where would I be now? It's, it's kind of like that movie, uh, The Family Man with Nicolas Cage, a, a great movie. It really explores this concept. What if you had made a different decision? And so I think about my guitar playing. What if I had been around different people? Uh, while I was playing, while I was learning my instrument? What if I had gone to different resources? Would I have taken so long to find the right technique, to find the right tone? And I wonder. And today I'm going to be talking about five things that I know if I was able to go back in time to my younger guitar playing self and say, hey, don't do that, do this instead. I know that my, my guitar playing journey would have been a lot shorter and I'm hoping that these five things help you to bring some shortcuts to your playing. All right, the second thing that I would tell my younger guitar playing self. Now, now you heard right, I did say the second thing. I'm gonna tell you the first thing in a little bit. What, what I've done in the past is I have always aimed to get a tone that works well in the room that I was in. So I would have a certain amount of delays at the end of the original note that I'd hit and I would aim for a certain amount of overdrive, a certain amount of reverb. And I didn't understand that once I took that setup to a large environment, I was not gonna sound the same in the large environment. A much bigger room, the, 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 the way it, it echoed, the, the reverb, whatever it was, just didn't produce the same sound. It's kinda like when you, when you have a dish, lasagna, casserole, you, you name it, roast, whatever. The ingredients that make up that dish on their own, some taste okay, some taste bland, some taste just plain horrible. But it's not about what the ingredient tastes like on its own, it's about what the ingredients taste like together, the cumin and the, the herbs and spices add, and it's roasted and it's put in a certain heat environment for a certain amount of time which produces certain chemical reactions and in the end when that dish is placed on your plate, the combination of those different tastes and the way the flavors have mixed together, that is what you're aiming for. That's the taste you're looking for. You're not looking for the taste that the ingredients had when you first started, you're looking for the overall. And that's the same thing with your guitar tone. You're not looking for what your guitar sounds like when it's on its own. You're not aiming for a good guitar tone when you're playing in a small room. You're looking for a good guitar tone when you're playing amongst other, in other instruments, when the drums are roaring away, when the bass guitar is droning, when the, when the vocalists are going. There you are as a guitarist in the middle of that mix and you sound amazing. You cut through, you, you own your pocket of the sound spectrum very well. I remember I'd be listening to I'd be in a sound check environment and I'd have maybe myself and another guitarist, we'd be sound checking and I'd be listening to them sound check and I'd go, man, there's just too much reverb on their, on their, on their signal. There's just too, the, they've got so much, so many delay repeats on their tail. It's just, it's unnecessary, it's excessive. My, my signal's fine, I've only got three delay repeats and I'm all good. But see, the thing is, I, I didn't understand that in the bigger, bigger picture, once the whole band was going, once the room was filled with people, those extra five delay repeats you didn't hear. And the reverb, the amount of reverb, that, that, that wet sound that was on the guitar, guitar signal was perfect because the, the drums just filled up the room and so the guitar needed to have extra whatever it was to cut through in the mix. And so I learned that when I, when I dial in my tone, when I'm playing on my own, I need to be aware of what it's gonna sound like in the, in the, the larger mix. And that takes some practice and that maybe takes some research. So the second thing, I'll get to the first soon. The second thing I would tell myself if I could go back in time and say, hey, Daryl, you need to change this about your playing, is I would say, Daryl, stop trying to produce the right tone in your bedroom and expect that to work in a larger room.
And yes, the number three thing. Remember, I'm getting to number one. The number three thing that I would tell my younger guitar self has to do with reverb. I think because, like I've said, my, my um, held back personality, whenever I would hear reverb on my guitar, it would make my guitar signal sound muddy. It would make my guitar sound far away. And so, no thank you, reverb. Ah, that was silly. So, reverb, which is short for reverberation, is everywhere. We're talking about sound waves leaving an object that produces sound and then bouncing all over a room and the sound waves repeating. Reverb is so much a part of our everyday life that we don't even notice that it's happening. The only time you would really recognize something to do with sound waves bouncing off of ob objects. <coughs> The only time you would really experience something to do with sound waves bouncing off of objects is if you had to be, let's say, in a large hall and you shouted out and then you heard what you had produced in terms of sound return to you two or more times. And in that case, we have what is called echo. Now, echo is different to reverb. There are, very, there are a lot of similarities, but what's different between echo and reverberation is that echo is distinct. You can hear the sound coming off the wall and returning to you, whereas reverb, you don't notice the sound returning to you. It's just so much you don't recognize it. I would go back to my younger self and I'd tap him on the shoulder and I'd say, hey, Daryl, learn about reverb. Reverb happens whether you like it or not. So why not manipulate reverb so that it enhances your guitar tone? And that's why reverb would be my number three thing that I would tell my younger guitar playing self. All right, here it is, the number one thing that I would tell my younger self. If you made it this far, you deserve to hear the number one thing. Aha. So, uh, I am six and a half feet tall. And while I was growing up, don't ask me why, but my body devoted 90% of the resources that I fed it to help me to grow up, but very little resources to growing sideways. So, so I, have, I have disproportionately slender legs. I've got very thin legs. My wife is probably gonna moan at me for saying this because Daryl, you're too hard on yourself. But, but dude, my legs are skinny. And so as I was growing up, I thought, you know, I could, if I could just go to gym and get big, yeah, I could put on some muscle and look big, yeah, I could get the chicks to dig me. I could get the guys to stop making fun of me. And so what I would do is I'd go to gym, but I misunderstood how this whole thing works. I'd look at the guys in the gym and I'd see them lifting big weights. So I assumed that the, the heavier the weights that you lifted, the more your muscles would grow. Would grow. And, and, and I had that completely wrong. It's not about how heavy the weights are. Yes, you do want to eventually get big weights because you're trying to get your muscles to, to work. You're trying to create this anabolic state, which means that whatever you feed your body, uh, your muscles grow from that. And so there, there's both that, but then I also learned that this is about feeding yourself a lot. So it's about eating 11 meals a day, basically. And I learned all that stuff, but I'm telling you all that because, ah, memories. I'm telling you all this because I translated that erroneous perspective when it came to putting on weight to my guitar playing. And I did this with other areas of my life as well. I wrote too hard. I, I would stir a cup of coffee too hard. And when I would play guitar, instead of, instead of this loose action, limp hand, I would I'd use my whole arm, I'd get my shoulder involved. I, th I thought that like, like if you wanna pick up more weight, you need to engage the muscle, and so I'd be doing a, and the, the, the muscle is tense and making sure it bends at the, at the elbow. I would take that same principle and apply it to my guitar playing, which meant that as I was playing guitar, I was hurting myself. I deserved that. So here's a picture of me playing a song that I wrote for my wife, Yale, at our wedding. And if you look at this picture, you can see my, look at my right, my right shoulder. It's crazy, dude, look how far forward it is. Why? Because I am clenching that muscle in my shoulder, trying to produce, a, I don't know, I'm not even sure what I was doing. It was just plain stupid. But what I would do, if I could go back in time to my younger guitar playing self, is I wouldn't, wouldn't even tap myself on the shoulder. I would slap myself several times in the face, grab myself by the shoulders and say, Daryl, you need to loosen up, dude. Because if you keep on playing like this, you're going to eventually develop uh, RSI, which is 
a repetitive stress injury and, and tendonitis, what's happening is you, you, your brain is sending signals to your muscles to move, but there's so much tension that the muscles are fighting against each other, which is gonna cause your nerves to become tired. And then what eventually happens is they just stop sending signals. The signals don't get to your muscles anymore. And then you start to damage your tendons and your muscles and all that kind of stuff. And I've experienced that. So, so I'm hoping that this helps you. If you have any sort of stiffness, I want to encourage you with the idea that you need to loosen up. You need to close your eyes while you play with the metronome and you need to picture every part of your body as being loose. As you move from a downstroke to an upstroke, your shoulder doesn't tense up. That there's, there's still, you, you make, that, make that motion and make sure that nothing tenses up, even your teeth. Don't play with your teeth clenched. No one likes a guitar player whose teeth are clenched. So here's the fourth thing. There's a general, like generally a lot of musicians as they grow up, they're asking the question, do I need to be able to read music to be a good musician? And I think, I think most musicians would say no. To, to be a great musician, you don't necessarily need to be able to read standard notation. There are many great musicians in the world who don't sight read. And at the same time, you're, you're not trying to do as little as possible to be a great musician. I, I think the general consensus about, um, amongst musicians would be if you do want to be a great musician, you at least need to, if you're not gonna be able to read music, you at least need to develop your air. You need to be able to distinguish between one note and another and tell how far apart they are from each other in the scale. You need to recognize a chord in a key. Is it the four chord? The one is it a five over seven chord? So let me tell you about my journey. I, I used to be a teacher in a college and, and what would happen is as we were preparing for the semester, just before the students all came back from holiday, wherever they had been, we would be setting up the curriculum for that semester. So, so we would give our students songs to perform. So we'd give them the original song, a recording of it, plus we would give them a chord chart. So the three of us trainers would split up those songs between ourselves and we would write the charts ourselves. What would happen is I would get my headphones on, there's me with my guitar or the college guitar, and uh, I press play, press stop, find the notes on the guitar, press play again, yep, confirm it, and then write down the chord. And so an hour and a half, two hours later, which isn't particularly long, but it isn't very quick either, I would then have finished my chord shot. Now the thing is the other trainers, they would be sitting at their desk with their headphones on, no instrument, typing away on their laptop, and they would walk away from their laptop having produced a chord chart within about half an hour to 45 minutes. And it astounded me. So I would take the chord chart I'd made, I'd print it out, hand it to my supervisor, and within 15 minutes he would hand it back to me with corrections. And I'd look at my chord chart and all the chords that I'd written with it, you know, like 85 chords, and I'd see all these corrections. And so I'd go back to my desk discouraged, and I'd see I'd written down D major seven. I, I listened to that chord five times. I'm sure it's D major seven. You say it's D major 11, come on. So I would, I would feel like I needed to contest. I need to prove him wrong. That's a D major seven. So I'd sit there and I'd listen, I'd play, rewind, play, rewind. But now what's happening is I am teaching myself. I am getting my ear to dig deeper, go to another level. I'm hearing that seven, but is there something around that seven? Is there, am I able to push out the other instruments and listen for more than just the seven? And as I did this, rewind, play again, rewind, play again. Ah, I hear the four. Okay, it's a D major 11. And so I did this again and again. And can you see, just like when you do it again and again, you get good at going there straight away, first time. And so my air got good at going deep. My air got good at blocking things out and going deep. This is the first reason why the other trainers were able to do their chord charts so quickly. So the other thing that enabled these other trainers to be able to write a chord chart with them, a music instruments, musical instruments with them, is that they understood the Nashville number system. Now I'm not gonna go into too much detail, the Nashville number system, if you can Google that, you'll find a ton of resources out there on what it is. But basically, in developing their ears, they were able to distinguish between different chords in a key. Your typical major key has got seven chords in it, and so you've got the one chord which has a triumphant sound, ta-da! And they were able to go, okay, in relation to that chord, the fifth chord, the let's say in the key of G, the D chord sounds like this. So, so as the song is playing and they're writing the chart, they're listening to it and they hear the one chord. So they write G, then they hear the five chord because they recognize what a five chord sounds like. Just like when your mother calls you, she doesn't have to tell you, hey, it's your mom. You just recognize her voice because your ear has learned to distinguish her voice 
amongst the many voices in the world. So you go, hey mom, how you doing? The same thing with different chords. There are seven chords in a key. And look, there are more chords that you can have, but just typically you've got seven chords in a key. And the great thing about most modern worship songs is that you've only got four chords. So you, you're able to distinguish one chord from another and you can hear it. And the great thing about that is that when you get up on a, a stage to do your worship set, you're not having to learn the chords by heart. You're not having to learn the chords like you would learn of the script of a play. You are just listening to the song enough times for you to know what the song sounds like. So then as the song is playing in your head, you go, that's a one chord, which goes to a six chord, goes to the four chord, back to the one chord. You know, because you, you're able to distinguish what those chords sounds like there, which, which means that, and remember, a worship set should be spontaneous. You wanna give room for the Holy Spirit to speak and to move and, and to slow things down and to speed things up. So you should be versatile as a, as a church worship musician. And this is why training your air will help you to be versatile and to be spontaneous and to go where the Holy Spirit wants you to go. And so that's the uh, fourth thing that I would tell myself if I could go back in time and get my attention. <laughs> Okay, the fifth and final thing is, um, well, let me give you some background. I, when I was in my 20s in South Africa, I owned two guitars. One of them is an Ibanez Gem 7 BSB, which I still own, a great guitar. It stays in tune like crazy. The other guitar was a Garth Brooks Signature Takamini, which I gave away. And I missed that guitar, it was a really good guitar. Actually, you, you would have seen that guitar in my wedding photo from earlier. Now, hold on, that sounds weird. That, that's, that almost sounds like, my wedding photo is a picture of me and my guitar. Although my wife does keep telling me that our marriage feels like that. Yeah, but she, I'm sure she doesn't mean anything by it. Anyway, this Floyd Rose, if you've ever worked with a Floyd Rose before, you know that they can be really difficult to, to, to restring, to set the intonation on. But the great thing is that I knew a guy and I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Now it's, it's great having a guitar technician, someone who can restring your guitars, who can dress your frets, level your frets, set your truss right correctly, make your guitar purr basically. But the downside is that if you constantly go to a guitar technician to set up your guitar, you never really recognize when your guitar is not the way it should be. And you also don't know how to correct it. So there you are playing with a guitar that you know is out of tune or maybe you don't recognize it's out of tune but you just keep playing. And that's the problem that I had. Now in South Africa, with this Ibanez and the locking nuts and everything, the guitar stayed in tune, so I didn't really have a problem with tuning. But when I came to Australia, this is awesome, but there was a problem connected to this awesomeness. Someone posted me a Gretsch Black Falcon. That's like a $7,000 guitar. They sent me an email saying, hey, be blessed. I felt like God wanted me to give you that. Big deal. But the thing is, it needed to be set up, and I didn't have a decent guitar tech to go to. The one guy I tried, I took my Ibanez to him because I needed my frets to be leveled and he did, he did such a rush job, gave it back to me, almost like, oh sorry, I haven't finished, but you can have it back. And when I would fret the fifth fret, the string at the fifth fret, the string would touch the 22nd fret at the same time. <laughs> so I had to fix that one up. Now this, this uh, Black Falcon, when I strung it and it's got a, a strange bridge that moves and a Bigsby tremolo and uh, the, I didn't realize that the intonation was seriously out. And I didn't realize that because I'd never learned to pick up what bad intonation sounded like. On top of that, the guitar needed to be set up. The, the, nut, the grooves in the nut were too small. So when I would bend the string or do some, some wide vibrato or whatever, the string would move out of, through, through the, the nut, but then would get pinched and wouldn't go back. So the guitar would be out of tune. And I didn't know how to fix it. And half the time I didn't recognize the problem. And then one day I was playing, you know, maybe the, the B and E string together around the 12th fret and it was just, there was such dissonance that I'd put overdrive on my guitar and it was just, yeah. it sounded so horrible. I thought to myself, I've got to do something about this. Now looking back, I realized how bad this is that no one told me, hey Daryl, your intonation is out. Because it was very, you could clearly hear when I was playing up there, the intonation was out. And that's like your best friend not telling you that your fly is down. So I did some research. I found out what intonation is, how to set it, and I, I battled a bit, but I, I worked it out and I learned how to do my own intonation, and now I can recognize when my intonation is out. And what I did is I did some research, and I was able to widen the groove on the nuts of my guitar and get this, take a lead pencil 
and color in the inside of that groove because a lead pencil, as much as it says lead, is made out of graphite. And graphite is a lubricant for your nuts. So I learned something. And the great thing is when I hear my guitar go out of tune, I can make adjustments, I can fix it myself on the spot. I can also tell when my guitar is not the way it should be. The downside is I can also tell when another guitarist, when their intonation is out or the guitar is out of tune. But like I said, when your friend's fly is down, so I'm hoping after these five things that I've, I've helped you to speed up your, your guitar playing process, that you learn some things quicker than I did, that you don't have to go the long route that I took to, to get to where I am today, that you can learn all these things in a few years time. Um, hey, subscribe for more videos like this. And if you would like to know more things about guitar, things that I haven't put up on video yet, send me a comment. I'll see what I can do about it. Other than that, have a great day.